All right. Well, welcome to Live from My Drum Room. And it's just an incredible honor and pleasure to welcome my guest today. The man we know is Mighty Max Weinberg, my dear friend, Max Weinberg. Welcome. Well, John, thank you so much. It's great to be with you, my dear, not so old friend. <laughs> You're not so old, but we are long, long, long time friends. We sure are, Max. Thank you so much. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not that much younger than you, but you're very kind. So, but thank you. And, you know, I, and speaking of that, I just have to say, I was thinking today, it just occurred to me, it was the fall, I, you, you probably don't remember this, the fall of 1993, who had just got the job with Conan O'Brien on the late night, late night with Conan O'Brien. I wrote you a letter, sent it to NBC Studios, it found its way to you, and you called me, and that began this great friendship that we have, so. Well, it certainly did, and I still have that letter. Wow. And I still have a warehouse full of symbols from <laughs> and uh, all of your friends at Zildjian, uh, which I still do play. I know you do, I know. Well, that's great, thank you. I, I, I remember you inviting me down to the show. I came down sometime a couple of months later, and uh, that first time meeting you, I, I remember it. I, you, you got me a seat right next to the bandstand. And at one point you looked over and saw me and you kind of pointed down at the symbol and I nodded my head and you went, okay. And, and then we, we hung out a little bit after the show and, and, um, yeah, I, it's, it's one of those things. It's like when I met Ringo and Charlie for the first time, it's like etched in my memory forever. So. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. And, uh, I must say that I had for 16 years, the best sounding ride symbol on TV. And I uh, use it for every single one of the nearly 4,000 shows that I did. Wow. Yeah, I remember. And yeah, drum sounded beautiful, live in the room and, and on TV. Well, we were very particular about uh, how the band sounded. And uh, one of the first things we did was we got rid of the clip-on uh, horn mics, and we went out and we got the old RCA mics, of which NBC uh, still had a few. And wow. they have that big round tone, and uh, you know the uh, uh, you play into that thing, and you know you you sound like Harry James. That's wow. That that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I remember it being. I mean, that the horns were such a big part of that band, obviously, and and they really had that presence. Um, well, the horns yeah. were the lead instrument of that band, and that was by design. I wanted to uh, basically act as if the <clears throat> the 1960s, 70s, and 80s hadn't happened. So it was my <laughs> own little homage to the Tonight Show Orchestra, uh, you know, starting way back with, you know, Skitch, uh, Henderson, and Milt DeLug, and, of course, the longest-serving band leader, Don Se Doc Severinsen. And that was the idea, because, you know, rock, you know, Paul Schaefer, my dear friend, did such a fantastic job with bringing rock and roll back to TV, or a, not even back playing rock and roll on TV. I went yeah. the other direction. I went back to swinging everything, yeah. uh, which is what I grew up with at my age. I'm 72 now. So, you know, to me, the being Eddie Shaughnessy, that was the greatest, greatest job you could have when I was a kid. And uh, to think that many years later, I'd see my same name in the same sentence as Doc Severinsen as a Tonight Show band leader, that, that was more than I ever dreamed possible. Yeah, that's, that is, that's a, what a, just, you know, I mean, I, I think people need to let that settle in for a second. The, the career you had before that, and you still have, of course, with Bruce and the E Street Band, but having that, those 16 years as the band leader on that show that became immensely popular, it became the Tonight Show. Um, just incredible. Just, uh, yeah. Congratulations. It was a great gig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a long term gig. I've been fortunate throughout my, uh, adult life since the age of 23 to basically have two gigs, uh, the, uh, the late night programs and uh, Bruce. So, you know, I have my own little groups, as you know, that I play with and uh, whether it's the Max Weinberg jukebox, uh, which is fun. That's all audience requests of my favorite rock songs. And, you know, every song we're going to play or my big band, I have a 23 piece orchestra where I don't drum. I am sort of the uh, Ricky Ricardo uh, figure up front. And uh, now I can't read, I can read drum charts, but I can't read like piano 
uh, music. I can't play piano or any instrument like that. But what I do is, as I'm leading the band, you know, like this, mm -hmm. I know where all the accents are. So I physically do the accents and it really makes it look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and basically we do now we, we we did that was a fun band it was something i always wanted to do where i stepped out from behind the drums and became a little bit of the <clears throat> empresario mm -hmm. and, uh 23 pieces uh salsa standards a little rock did two years playing at the rainbow room in new york and we've reduced that to i do one show a year now for little steven van zant's other policemen's ball, he calls it. And it's a benefit for the Widows and Orphans Fund of the NYPD. And we do it every December. And I get the uh, band together and everyone pulls out their tuxedos and I dust off my white dinner jacket. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. actually a lot of fun. I'll bet, man. It's, it's so great to, to be able to do that, to do those kinds of gigs, you know, when you've, when you've, you know, you've, you've, made it you know in terms of having this long-term gig that you have and you can do these other things their benefits they're they're you know for a good cause and and they're fun you know what's better than that well i feel like i've been very blessed throughout my life and uh and not just musically but in many many ways so uh you know as you start to get older you know you have to if your eyes wake open up <laughs> be grateful to get out of bed so yeah, you know, yeah. that's where it starts. If you can show gratitude for everything that you've, you know, been able to latch on to or even try to go for, um, you know, that's a good start to the day. And um, you know, like all of us, I had certain fantasies as a teenager and a young drummer started when I was seven years old. Uh, and the reality has <laughs> actually, when I look back on it, uh, for example, for next year, 50 years with Bruce and the E Street Band, the reality has actually far surpassed the dreams I had. So uh, I don't know what to say about that other than yeah. I'm the luckiest person in the world. That's, I was going to, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I was going to mention next year marks 50 years and uh, what what an incredible milestone and just, just unbelievable and and i i do i don't want to forget to mention first of all to everybody watching uh if you haven't read the cover uh art of the modern drummer cover feature on max and jay weinberg it's a great read there's a great separate interview interview with you max that's really fantastic and then there's a great dual interview with you and jay and for anyone who doesn't know this i don't know how you don't know this but max's son jay is the drummer in slipknot he's a phenomenal drummer uh, just a, and, and the phenomenal young man, just, I can't say enough about, I'm so honored to know him and, and to have known him as long as I have Max, you know, as a, I, 2006 was the first time you brought him up to Zildjian and I got to meet him. And I think he'd only just been playing a little while at that point. Yeah. He started, uh, well, he was born in 1990. I'm honored to be his dad. Uh, I've never seen anybody work so hard and not just drumming, but everything he's ever applied himself to, both my children, his sister, Allie, who yeah. is a, uh, a producer for PBS NewsHour and their weekend co-anchor. She's a journalist in the political sphere. Uh, Jay was an incredible hockey player. He was a goalie. Yeah. And that when he was a little, little kid, that was his dream. And when he was about 14, which would have been around 2014, uh, he started to hack around on one of my old drum sets and he got really good, really fast. It was very <laughs> impressive. And I was working every day in New York. So I had, you know, uh, oh, I should say 2004, not 14. So I was doing the, the late night program commuting every day. And he just went up there and, and, and just started figuring out how to coordinate the bass drum and the snare drum. And he started playing to, you know, Ramon songs and punk songs and he figured it out and I hadn't heard him do that he didn't even really share <laughs> that he was doing it um and mainly because you know my, my generation of parents and I'm sure it still holds true today you know we give our kids all sorts of activities to do you know after school activities and I think one of the reasons he didn't tell me was he didn't want me to to like Hey, you're, you should take some drum lessons. He didn't want to take drum lessons. He, yeah. he was strictly doing it for fun, 
which of course is the best way to get into it. And and I think the hockey, the discipline of 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 you know getting up at three o'clock in the morning, you know every weekend and being the youngest uh, guys on the ice, the constant drilling of dropping down and the discipline that it, you know, and dedication that it took, he was able to transfer that sort of posture to teaching himself how to play the drums. People assume I had something to do with it. I had nothing to do with it. And in fact, you know, I often have said <laughs> when I was a little kid, like eight years old, I have never seen anybody trade Pokemon cards. If you remember those things, I do with such yeah. unbelievable skill with older guys. There was a store in Red Bank, New Jersey called the Hobby Shop. And that's where all the kids got their Pokemon cards. And Jay would go in there and he would trade uh, these cards with the owner of the place. And it was real horse trading. And based on that, I thought he would probably go into the financial world or legal world <laughs> or something. You yeah. couldn't win an argument with him. And <laughs> they always came out on top. Um, and uh, But, you know, he just worked at it. And he uh, just second year in a row won best metal drummer and modern drummer he uh we couldn't my wife becky and i couldn't be more proud of what he's accomplished and as you say he is the sweetest kid in the world he and really is my wife chloe they live outside of nashville and uh you know on your drums i mean he has far surpassed me years ago and i could tell you well, stories all day long about uh, uh jay's ability to um internalize anything he hears and be able to play it it's it's pretty impressive to me as a drummer yeah yeah no he's he I, the, that first time i met him so he'd been playing about two years i think and you could see he was a natural i mean he really had a, a great natural feel i mean and we know as drummers that when you're a young drummer i mean unless you've got a natural feel that's i think the first thing that you that i can detect from someone who's just learning how to play is they're just their mechanics aren't quite there yet you know like it takes time to just sort of develop those things. And I just remember him sitting down and just being really loose and comfortable. And, and he was telling me about the drummers that he listened to his influences. And at that time, Jason Bittner, I remember was like one of his favorite drummers and, um, and you could hear it in his playing, you know, he was really, uh, going for that type of style and, and, uh, and just to see where he is now, it's just, it, I can't, Imagine the, the, the pride that you have, how proud you are for how successful he's become. Well, yeah. you know, actually, from the day he was born and the same with his sister, both my wife and I have been totally proud of them. They're really, yeah. you know, upright citizens. And uh, that was important to us. So uh, I believe that if you gave them independence at an early age, which is what we did, they would act responsibly. If you give them great responsibility, they will either embrace it or not. And fortunately for us, our kids did and avoided a lot of the pitfalls of being teenagers because they were so focused. And that's a that's a real blessing above everything else. The fact that he's, you know, playing. I mean, when I see him play, I can't believe uh, the dexterity, the combinations and permutations, the stamina, all the things that go into making a great drum performance musical. Mm -hmm. uh, we had occasion this past summer where I had a day off in Belgium and we were playing uh, Belgium the following night and he was playing about an outside, an hour outside of Belgium, Brussels. And uh, Roy Bitten from the E Street Band and his son Alex and I took a car out there and went to the Slipknot show. And it was just, there were like 180,000 people. It was a festival. Wow. And fortunately, we had passes, and it was just between the pyrotechnics and and the the, the start stop on a dime approach. It's most impressive, and then the flames come up, and it's 100 <laughs> degrees, you know. And he's wearing a latex mask, so uh, you know, hats off to Jay Weinberg. And the article in Modern Drummer was uh, it came out great. I thought uh, the, the really writer uh, did a terrific job, and. Uh, um, you know, we have both different, different, but similar perspectives, um, and Jay and I, you know, cause he grew up, you know, as my son, as a professional musician, but mainly on TV. I mean, he didn't know, both my kids really didn't know anything about my rock band background until they were much, much older. Mm -hmm. You know, Bruce was just, you know, 
uh, his children's father and my kids were about the same age. So, um, you know, they knew me as a TV guy. That's the guy with the suit yeah. and smile and, uh, you know, the uh, a swinging drummer on TV, which was which was kind of funny, you know, and then, of course, doing the comedy. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been a real uh, thrill to be able to first time we took them on the road. We took them out of school, uh, Jay and his sister, Allie, when Jay was, I think, nine. And what an education to be able to, you know, go to Europe for three and a half months in a very secure situation where you have a, a history social studies teacher as a mother. So you are doing your homework first and then you go out. <laughs> and it made them very aware of uh, just the multitude of cultures that create planet Earth, at least uh, with the places we played. And um, that was something that's really benefited them throughout their adult lives. Yeah. Jay's 33, his third of his, his daughter, his uh his uh, sister is 36. I'm a grandfather of my daughter, my daughter Allie's daughter, Anne. So it's all good, you know? That's great. Yeah. Oh, that's great, Max. Yeah. And and before I forget, I just, I want to give a shout out to the, the man that interviewed you and, and Jay, which I believe it was Mark Griffith for Modern Drummer. Does that sound yeah. right? Yeah. Mark did a fabulous job. He's, he's a, he always does a fantastic job. And I also want to just mention one more thing about Modern Drummer. The, uh, there's a YouTube video on their, on their YouTube channel that's a, a rundown of your tour kit that's really fantastic. And it has you and your drum tech giving all the ins and outs of your kit. And it's, it's really, I would just encourage everybody to check that out on YouTube. It's a great rundown on, on uh, you know, what goes into a, you know, a show and what you do and how you prepare. And it's, it's, I found it really informative. So. Well, um, you told me the other day and I have yet to check it out. I remember doing it. It was right at the beginning of our tour. And uh, you know, I, I, I've played the same drum setup since I was seven years old, you know, uh, four drums and three cymbals. And uh, uh, that's all I've ever needed. And um the greatest piece of advice I ever got. If you look at old pictures of me from the seventies, my symbols are a little bit high and angle. Mm -hmm. and, um, as you know, I became dear friends with the late great greatest buddy rich. And in, in about the last 12 years of his life, we spoke all the time and, um, I realized through talking to him, uh, he asked me once how, you know, how my cymbals were set up. I mean, he didn't know our band from, you know, from the Beatles, right? And, <laughs> uh, and I said, well, you know, they're kind of, kind of high. He goes wrong. You got to keep everything so you don't have to move your elbows. I said, really? He goes, yeah, that's that's what I watch me when I play. That's what I do. Yeah, there was something about me, I guess, that he liked. And uh, he would really, uh, he, he would show me things before a show. He played, you know, community colleges in Jersey. I'd get there early. And I think it was because I never asked him how he played so fast. Yeah. Uh, and I also knew the drum history. Uh, you know, I knew the drummers well, the drummers that he listened to growing up and uh, uh, a lot of the drummers he would meet, Buddy Rich, that is, uh, you know, really didn't know the history. And I did, you know, going back to the creation in 1897, I think, of the bass drum pedal. Wow. And he made the observation, yeah, the bass drum pedal immediately put one drummer out of work because now <laughs> play the bass drum and the snare. <laughs> Uh, and it's gone on from there, but those conversations are deeply, deeply embedded in my mind. And he was a, uh, to me, he was a lovely, sweet, uh, soft-spoken guy, you know, and I'm so glad I got to know, uh, Buddy and Joe Morello and some of the guys that you and I have admired on a yeah. level you know, from that era when we were little kids, you know, um, um, you know, I had the great occasion to meet and, but not get to know Sonny Greer, Sonny Payne, Philly Joe Jones, um, you know, so you hear all these stories, it's just fascinating to hear those guys talk. Yeah. 
Boy. We can I, I, talk about, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, Chick Webb's orchestra. He was a teenager and he would listen outside of the theater. I don't even think it was the Apollo at that point, but he would be in, he'd go up to Harlem as a teenager and listen outside and hear Chick Webb. To hear Buddy Rich rhapsodize about Chick Webb, that was yeah, something. That's something, man. That's a that's a glimpse that you know only a few people have into Buddy. You know, it's pretty special. Um, yeah, I always considered yeah. it. You know, I guess, you know, it was a, it might have been our common religious background or again, I never asked him how we played so fast. Yeah. Yeah. A story though, And I know it's funny because I've told it before and it's gotten a laugh, but, uh, but he always played the bottom line in New York every April for years and years with the big band. And this one night and they had these two little dressing rooms, the band had one, he had the other. And there were about five drummers sitting around after the show with Buddy Rich and a couple of them were really bold-faced named drummers. And at one point, Buddy went around the room asking everybody uh, what we wore on our feet when we played the drums. And, you know, this is in the uh, early 80s. And, you know, people, you know, there were drummers that didn't wear any shoes. Yeah. <laughs> so completely dismissed anybody who played barefoot. How can you do that? Disgusting. But he asked each of us and a couple of guys, before me, I, I knew enough to hold back. Uh, a couple of guys before me said, well, you know, I wear sneakers. Sneakers, you can't play the drums in sneakers. You have to wear a boot. You can't play drums unless you're wearing a boot with a heel so you can keep your heel down, except for the the bombs, he would say, you know, the bass drum accents. He finally got to me, he goes, Weinberg, what do you wear? I said, uh, well, actually, uh, I wear sneakers, but they're shaped like a boot. And I was kidding. <laughs> I don't know why, but I had a I had a safe face and he cracked. I made him up. And that was early on in um uh in our sort of friendship. And the next time I saw him, he gave me his phone number. So, you know, I was Mr. Fanboy, so I wouldn't bother him, but I would call up and you know, we basically talked about everything but drums. That's so great. Wow. Uh, exploration, politics. Uh, hardly ever talked about, you know, I mean, if I asked him about Harry James or some of the people he played with, Charlie Parker, he liked to, it wasn't reminiscing. It was, you know, it was just, these were, you know, these were the people who were the superstars of his day, you know, who he played with. And, uh, um, you know, that to me was very, very interesting. That's great, man. Yeah. I mean, he, 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 recognized you like at another level and and uh yeah i i think you know as a human and it, it wasn't you know you didn't have to your conversation didn't have to be about how do you play so fast you know which is like you say which is the typical question probably everybody ever asked him is you know how can i play as fast as you buddy that probably drove him crazy you know uh <laughs> well get that you know and uh he was uh uh, contrary to what the myth has become, he was uh, he was uh, uh, tough on himself. He was tough on the musician because he was an extreme perfectionist. But he was a really lovely guy. I mean, just had a he had a big heart. You know, yeah. you wouldn't want to piss him off, <laughs> rapper. And he came up, you know, at a time when you had to take care of yourself. But yeah, caught him at a time in his life, and I guess I had a certain personality that you know, meshed in some, some way, you know, and, uh, uh, I remember he once said, so oh, you're a rock drummer. Uh, you know, the only rock, good rock drummer out there is, uh, Danny Serafini. Are you, are you as good as him? <laughs> oh, I'm not as good as him. <laughs> uh, at least you're honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Well, I, I want to jump backwards a little bit to talk about you. And, and we mentioned that, um, Next year marks 50 years playing with Bruce. And I know I read this in your, in your MD interview, the, and, and I've, I've heard stories about your audition with Bruce. I know it was a, it was a, a cattle call basically back in 1974 when you went in and the, the famous uh, ad in the paper that said no ginger bakers, which is I, for years, Max, I thought that was a joke, but I realized that that is really true, right? That's how the. 
No junior ginger bakers. No junior ginger bakers. Meaning, you know, I don't want a guy that's busy and. That's even it, more. You know, it was yeah. just fun to bring it up if, if you'll allow me. Uh, so it was in a paper called The Village Voice, uh, which was a. Of course, yeah. Oh, an alternative newspaper in New York. I don't even know if it still exists, but they used to have this huge section in the want ads at the back after the apartments and uh, cars and things like that. Huge section was called Public Notice Music. And uh, I had been doing all sorts of jobbing work. I was living with my parents at home. I was 23 years old at this particular time. I was going to Seton Hall University. I was playing at night in the Broadway show Godspell. Right. I was club dates with rock bands or, you know, society bands, any kind of work I could get. I never limited, uh, you know, I was a jack of all trades. I loved rock and roll, but if a guy was gonna pay you, you know, a hundred bucks to play cha-chas in 1972 or three, I was gonna play cha-chas. Like I was gonna play the hell out of the cha-cha. Yeah. <laughs> I had all that stuff. I was what they used to call a quote unquote legitimate drummer. And uh, that's a phrase that the old, like my drum teacher, Gene Thaler, who was a, uh, you know, born in the twenties and he was a real kind of, I guess you call him a beatnik now, but loved the drums. And, you know, he was the guy that turned me on to all the, the older guys. But um, so I could play a little bit of everything in my own style. Rock was my first love, of course, being, you know, of that generation and it, the ad said, wanted drummer, no junior, junior Ginger Bakers. Ginger Baker was an unbelievable drummer. I yeah. mean, one of the top drummers, no doubt about it. But what Bruce wanted was, Ginger Baker ruined a lot of drummers because everybody wanted to be Ginger Baker. You know, drum solos and two, two bass drums and very flamboyant. And, and remember, they were a trio cream. So, you know, June, anybody who knows the Ginger's real story, he, you know, he goes way, way back in drumming before cream. And as a seriously credible jazz drummer, bebop mostly. And um, I digress. So what that transmitted to me, no junior Ginger Bakers, which is really snarky to say that. <laughs> Uh, it meant that, okay, I get it. I didn't know who Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band were, but they had a record deal. It said on Columbia Records. And the ad spoke to me in that it telegraphed what they wanted. They wanted an accompanist. And as I found out, you know, Bruce's band, Bruce wanted an accompanist. He was very interested in that point. Uh, to He was getting known as a hot guitar player. Mm -hmm. And he and he is. He's an incredible guitar player. But incredible. He didn't, he didn't want to be known as like a, a gunslinging guitar player. He wanted to put the guitar down. He was really more of a front man. And he, the way, and I didn't know this at the time, but the way he wanted to develop his show was very much in the soul review uh, fashion. And I had a lot of experience doing that growing up uh, in the suburbs uh, where I did. Uh, going down to the city, which in my case was Newark, and playing with all sorts of, you know, rhythm and blues, blues, uh, funk, wasn't funk back then, it was soul, you know, integrated bands, you know, white guys, African-American guys, and I could keep a great groove, but I also, if you know, give the drummer sign, I could show off. So I had skills that were pretty broad based. And the one thing I didn't care about doing was a drum solo. Uh, I could do it, but it meant nothing to me because nobody ever hired you to do a drum solo. Right. At, you know, when you're 15 or 16 years old, they hired you to keep the beat. And I was really good at that. And a lot of those gigs were sort of show bands, which kind of don't exist at that level anymore, I guess. But, you know, where it was three guys up front in tuxedos and a backing band. And, every, and there was a choreography and there were accents that you had to hit. Stage business. So I had a lot of experience doing that. And, and that also was unusual for, you know, the early 70s. And um, I wasn't a wannabe anybody because I was working. And, and the, the sort of the pact I made with my parents was um, they would support me in everything I did as long as I worked. 
uh, my situation was such that myself and my, uh, at the time, two older sisters had to work um, the financial situation. So, you know, okay, I put together the idea. I love playing the drums. Now I just got to figure out how to get gigs. And <laughs> I was like a little businessman at eight, nine years old, and I've never been out of work as a drummer, except when the East Street Band broke up and I had two young children and I wasn't so crazy about continuing uh, that career at that time. That's a whole other story. But getting back to the audition, okay, so they wanted a accompanist and it said everything from Chuck Berry to Jer Jerry Lee Lewis. And I was playing the show Godspell and I had my drums up there. So my audition with Bruce was the first night. I mean, by this point, something like 50 plus drummers had auditioned. And as he's told me even recently, you know, some guys could keep a great groove. Some guys could solo, which I hated. He said, some guys could do pretty good feel, you know, pretty good fills. You were the only guy really out of like 60 guys who could combine all of those things um, and take direction because I worked with older people who, you know, uh, uh, needed, I had to take direction from them, you know, catch a, a kick from a dancer or, mm -hmm. you know, kind of stage business. So um, uh, I was, the, the, the takeaway from that first meeting was we played for three hours. And 20 years later, I asked Bruce, I didn't know at the time that everybody got a half hour, no matter how good or how bad you were. And, you know, he could tell within a few bars whether you had it or not. If you closed your eyes when you were playing, you were immediately eliminated. If you didn't look at him, mm -hmm. you were eliminated. If you, uh, you know, were trying to lock quote unquote, lock in with the bass player, you were eliminated. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Strict criteria. And 20 years later, and this was during the period after the band broke up in 89, we were sitting on his front lawn in, in LA and we got to talking and having a couple of shots of tequila. And that. <laughs> I never really knew why you chose me. You know, it was just suddenly I'm in the band and the band was, you know, we were, we were struggling at the time. This was no, big yeah. act i mean you know driving ourselves in a 65 station wagon and uh it was really the bottom in fact i took a major pay cut to leave godspell on broadway to join the e street band and duke ellington once said in an interview that i read when i was in high school that a musical profit far outweighs a financial loss and i always thought that was a cool saying so yeah, yeah dropped out of college. I joined the E Street Band. I did go back 15 years later and finish my degree because I paid for it and I didn't want to waste the money at the time. And they held it open and I went back and I finished, made the Dean's List twice, which I'm very proud of. That's great. You know, got in the band and in the audition, uh, he said, well, you know, uh, we did a they, same songs with everybody, you know, did a couple of old rock songs. Do you know any of my songs? I didn't know any of his songs, but there was this one song where he said, well, you know, we're doing an arrangement of Fats Domino's Let the Four Winds Blow, which was a real sort of real fast shuffle, like a boogie almost with a lot of accents. And, um, and I, you know, I did, I knew Fats Domino's version. I never heard Bruce's, I never, you know, I never uh, seen these. There's a story about how I opened to Bruce and Bruce Springsteen before it was called the E Street Band with another guy at Seton Hall University, but I got sick during our set and I left. So I never actually saw Bruce and Clarence Clemens and Gary Talent, the original E Street Band and Dan Federici. So um, he said, well, it's funny you asked me that, you know, why did I chose you? So we played the same thing with everybody. Now there were guys who were really good and, you know, they could keep a good beat, solid beat. And he goes, and then I did a, a, a thing where I just made like, uh, you know, safe at home, like a move like that, like stop, stop. If you miss it, I did it again. Like really obvious, stop. And he goes, if you missed it twice, you are out. He goes, to tell you the truth, I'd say nine out of 10 guys got it. 
And like I said, he was telling me, if you missed it twice, you were out of contention. So that was easy because I was, I, you know, immediately, I mean, when you sit down and play with Bruce Springsteen, I don't care who else is playing, you can tell where the energy is coming from. And, um, and even that first night when I met him in August of 1974. So he said, well, I did that with you and you stopped. You know, I made it really obvious. And then there was a long pause. And then he threw out his arm like that. And out of every single guy that auditioned, I was the only one who hit a rim shot. To me, it was second nature. If a dancer kicks, he hit a cymbal. You know, yeah, it was, yeah. And he said, that's my guy. And there were some really, there were good, there were some really good drummers who auditioned, who some names might be, uh, 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 might be remembered by people, but were kind of big in the New York scene uh, um, in, the, in the early 70s, you know. Uh, Steve Gebb was not one of them, <laughs> and I can tell you. Uh, but, you know, he saw that I paid attention and that I had yeah. chopped. And then I had, you know, and the one thing I did do is after that first audition, played for three hours. Now, I didn't know he'd only ever played for a half hour. And wow. I only brought a bass drum, a snare drum, and a hi hat because I didn't want to. It said Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis. Well, if you see a lot of the old videos of those guys, the drum sets, they weren't big drum sets. Right. And songs were pretty much irrelevant, you know, uh, in terms of playing Chuck Berry music. I mean, there are Tom Toms in them. Only one, generally. You know, three-piece drum sets, nobody would remember this now, but one Tom was fairly normal. In, yes. Uh, you know, in the, uh, I remember the Lovewood catalog, the Metro liner, three three now snare a small time and a bass drum and uh anyway so i had this uh this i had a snare drum a bass drum and a hi-hat the elevator was out in the rehearsal studio which was the original sir i remember the address it was 250 west 54th street in new york right next door to what was studio 54. wow <laughs> harry you know i had a I just brought what I need. So a, a light trunk case. I had to carry my stuff up four flights of stairs and set them up out in the hall while, you know, everybody brought their drums. And if you came in with like five Tom Toms and six cymbals, that wasn't a good sign. Yeah. At the time, you know, that's not where the direction he wanted to go. So I came in with barely a drum set. I didn't know this at the time, but I later learned that, you know, Clarence told me, like, well, this guy must think he must think he's hot shit. He's and I'd be bringing a whole drum set. <laughs> and actually, it was because I had to put him in my car, and I didn't, I didn't feel I needed a, you know, I mean, if it said something like Zeppelin, or of course Zeppelin only had four drums too, but you know, something more progressive. Um, uh, you know, Hal Blaine had that eight tom drum set, which he used to great effect. And drummers started to have a lot of toms, a lot of cymbals. Billy Cobham, who was everybody's favorite drummer, the, the drummer, every drummer's favorite drummer at the time. Sure. A big, big drum set. <clears throat> so, you know, I came in and kind of made a minimalist statement, but apparently, you know, I had the goods and I had, uh, you know, the, the desire, the musical experience was so incredible that first night that I went over to him and I said, I don't know you, you don't know me. I don't know who you're going to pick, but I'll tell you what, I'll play with you for nothing. And I meant it. And I mean, I meant that emotionally. Yeah. Really over the last 50 years, that wasn't the arrangement, but <laughs> the feeling I got that night, I never felt before. I never, and it wasn't just Bruce. It was certainly his leadership, his focus and intensity of what he wanted to do as he was performing. He was facing me. He was like five feet in front of me, facing me. It was what he was doing, but it was also what Clarence Clemens on sax, Gary Talon on bass, Dan Federici on organ were doing, the way they were locked into what he was doing. That I had never experienced, that kind of cohesion. Yeah. And I didn't know what, I mean, it was Bruce Springs and Eastry Ben. So, you know, he was, he would, uh, but actually it wasn't, that that was the first usage of that name. They didn't start using the full name 
until the first show that, which was two weeks later, that Roy Bitten and I did. The first time they used the name and uh, the title and the E Street Band. Before that, it was just Bruce Springsteen. And uh, I mean, I have posters that I collected back then uh, that says Bruce Springsteen, S-T-E-I-N. Wow. Yeah. But he had a little bit of an audience in New Jersey and Philadelphia and maybe a little bit in Austin, Texas. But it was a hard slog up. Unfortunately, yeah. we're all in our young 20s. And, you know, that's what you're supposed to do when you're in your 20s. Yeah. Uh, uh, amazing. Amazing. I, yeah. And it just, I'll just say the, it amazes me that, um, you joined the band when recording, uh, born to run and at age 23, as you say, at the time turning 24 playing with the maturity and, and you've just explained why with all the, the, you know, your history and, and what you'd been doing before. And I only knew, I guess I, you might've told me, but it, it had slipped my mind until I read the interview in MD that you'd been doing Godspell. And that that explains a lot too that you were able to come in there with this really fully formed professional uh, ability, you know, to to take the direction that Bruce was giving. That probably, like you say, a lot of people weren't getting it. They weren't seeing it. They weren't, you know. And I'll, I'll be. And I'll just say this, Max. My instinct would have been to try to lock in with Gary. So I I would have flunked. I would have. I would have been one of the first guys to get tossed out. But. <laughs> It's an interesting band because it's there's never been a discussion about you know that that sort of you know we just do it naturally lock in and yeah. with, this band is a where a lot of bands that i've noticed are kind of almost more organic uh we're like a flying wedge and it comes from bruce at the point and it filters down to the rest of everybody else you know so i'm I, you know whether it's in the studio or on stage, I'm directly behind Bruce on stage or in his studio where we record probably three or four feet away from him. He's behind a sheet of glass in a booth. So it, we don't we don't talk about, well, I'll do this here. You do that there. We just sort of play. And it's very unlike, you know, the sort of you have to lock in, obviously. Sure. Get, I just did it naturally from the start because he's such an amazing bass player. Um, very uh, under, in terms of bass players, um, uh, underrated for how actually incredibly good he is. Um, I agree, yeah. He, he is up there with Paul McCartney in terms of his uh, sense of melody and rhythm, you know, and uh, look, there are things we don't do uh, musically speaking, but there's a lot we can do. And, uh, but we, not a lot of talking in this band about things. Uh, also it helps that it's formed as a benevolent dictatorship. So there isn't a lot of discussion about stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I but you know, I, I, from the outside looking in all these years, I would have thought that I, I put you and Gary in that same category or, you know, um, one of my absolute favorite rhythm sections along with Charlie and Bill Wyman, which was another case, I believe of what you're talking about too. I don't think Charlie and Bill ever really put their heads together and said, I'm going to play this. And I mean, they just followed Keith and they just had that natural ability to lock in the way you and Gary do. And I think of Mick Fleetwood and John McVie and those, they maybe do have a conversation. I don't know. I've never asked Mick Fleetwood that question, but Again, just a really locked in unit that just it, it feels so organic to me when I listen to you guys. I've seen you live so many times where I just I, I, I feel like, man, I'd love to play with a bass player like Gary Talent because he just his he's just seems to be right on the same page with you all the time. Yeah, the rhythm section, uh, you know, rhythm sections generally uh, dictate the propulsion of the band. And when you have the great fortune to be you know, together for 50 years, you've explored everything. And you know, there's nothing wrong with talking about, I'll do this, you do that. There's nothing wrong at all with that, you know? Yeah. Uh, just when you do get to uh, to know each other as players and also individuals, but as, you know, what your job is in the context, it just kind of falls that way. And the people you've mentioned, Charlie and Bill, particularly Charlie and Bill, uh, who I saw first in 1965, with Brian Jones, um, 
they were quite unique because um, neither of them was a, a real studied musician. They did odd things. And, uh, and as great as they were, I mean, they were incredible. Uh, the, the, the Bill, Bill Wyman's bass playing is non-parel in the, in, in the Stones canon of music. Uh, you know, and uh, the Charlie Watts and Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and Ron Wood would all say the same thing. So would Darryl, so would Daryl Jones, who's an incredible bass player. Uh, met Daryl when he was playing with, I think it was either Sting or Peter Gabriel in 1988. We were on that Amnesty tour. Monster musician, phenomenal, mm. great guy too. But yeah, so, you know, rhythm sections, uh, you know, define that particular thing. There's a muscularity when... Roy Bitten, myself, and uh, Gary play. And Roy, as a, as a piano player, it was very interesting because he, he his, his playing is so integral to Bruce's music in a melodic sense that very often he'll end up playing around the rhythm section, which creates its own kind of inner mm -hmm. uh, uh, shuffle disorganization, you know? Uh, we are really about feel and not the E Street Band doesn't feel like I mean I can play those songs with anybody else and it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't feel the same. And the same with mm -hmm. you know when I play those beats, it's a you know what's be become known as a sort of signature sound. You no, know, it's like Ringo. You can be in a Ringo tribute, a, you know, Beatles tribute band, and you could study every single thing you want to. But it's not going to sound like Ringo Starr, you know. Yeah. Frank yeah. Sinatra, you know all those great musical personalities, where when you you know it's him, you know it's Charlie Watts, you know it's you know Levon Levon Helm, you know uh, the great the guys that are in you hold up you know to me before the big beat the guys that I yeah. admired who had a distinct musical personality when they played you knew it was them yeah but this this book the big beat that I wrote with Bob Santelli is now. Uh, of course, still a writer, but the um, uh, it was my the longest term paper anybody ever wrote. <laughs> professor, we started where he gave me assignments, and then I got obsessed with doing this book. It's coming out again in uh, I think January. Uh, that people can look at wherever you buy books today. Um, uh, it, it was the idea was not how you play the drums, but why. And so many of the drummers in that book are uh, we've lost uh, since mm -hmm. I did the book in 1981. I started the book um, uh, that uh, it's really a, it turned out to be a history book of that era. Yeah. When you had Hal Blaine, Johnny B from Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels, uh, you know, DJ Fontana, yeah. Earl Moore, all the greats who made all those great rock records. Yeah. Uh, and Jim Keltner, of course, is still around and playing great. Russ Kunkel. Uh, all of them leading up to Ringo Starr, who, like Gene Krupa in the 30s, Ringo, someone said, and it's a quote, Ringo, quote, made the drummer a high-priced guy. End yeah. of quote. Which is what Gene Krupa did when he played with Benny Goodman. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And I, I also want to, yeah, and you, there's... You, you said exactly what I was going to say, Max, and I'll just reiterate what you said in that sadly, many of these people that you interviewed back 40 plus years ago are no longer with us. And that's, that's what makes this, I think, even extra more important in it. And when it's back available next year, I encourage people to go out and get it because I mean, there's so little on Roger Hawkins and it was, it's just so every now and again, I'll go back and read this and I never got to meet Roger Hawkins, but he's a huge hero and influence and, yeah. Um, you know, and as you say, and, and, uh, Dino Donnelly is now no longer with us. And this, it really, I, you know, I'm not just saying it, Max, it was so ahead of its time in many respects. And in, in, in the one sense, it was, these guys were all still very active and, and they were the right guys at the time, but now it makes it even more important because there's a, it's a history lesson. It's documentation, you know, it's. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that comment and the sentiment, John, because, you know, people always say, uh, well, you should, you know, talk to those people before they're gone, right? Now, uh, it happens a lot. Yeah. And this yeah. book came about because there was a character in LA, and I think he's still out there, who was a real scene maker, 
in the rock scene of, of you know, the Hollywood, L.A., 60s and 70s rock scene named Harvey Kubernick. And he was a writer. He used to write for Billboard. And um, so we were playing at the Roxy Theater, uh, which is still there. Mm -hmm. Shows, may have been five shows. Uh, and I got together for lunch with uh, Harvey. And Harvey said, uh, do you want to meet 50 of your favorite drummers out here? And I said, I don't have the time. I only have two days off. He goes, okay, well, in that case, I'll introduce you to all 50 of them by going to Hal Blaine's house. <laughs> and, and it was a funny line. So he took me over um, to Hal Blaine's house. It was in an area called Los Feliz. It was a brick mansion. And um, Hal Blaine, wow. I mean, I remember when I was, I guess, 20... 19, 1970, Look Magazine uh, did a story on Hal Blaney. He was on the cover. Look was kind of like life. It was a picture magazine. And it had a picture of Hal Blaine standing next to his Rolls Royce. And, uh, you know, with the title Hitman. And it was all about Hal Blaine and, you know, all the records he played on. And that's how I became aware of Hal Blaine. And here, this is uh, 1970. So this is 1978. Eight years later, of course, now I know who Hal Blaine was, right? And we go there, and a houseman, I believe that, should, but, oh, answered the door in full houseman livery and broke <laughs> the house office, which was a big room. We go in the room, and the first thing I noticed was the walls and the ceiling, much like your room there, all of the walls and the ceiling were covered with gold and platinum singles. Wow. Not albums, singles. Singles, yeah. Wallpaper and paint, which I blew my mind. And Hal, of course, was the sweetest guy. He became one of my closest friends after that. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I think you're on his joke list. I was on his joke list. But, you know, I got to sit there for three hours that afternoon and ask him every question I ever wanted to uh, about that, that I had about, you know, recording for the birds and the monkeys and the moms and papas and how and Phil Spector. But I didn't record it. It was just a conversation. So the next couple of days later, we flew from L.A. to Phoenix to play what became actually a very famous show for us and a version of Rosalita that became sort of the definitive, you know, boss mania version of Rosalita in Phoenix. And I flew over there with uh, Dave Marsh the rock writer and uh, journalist. And I said, you're not going to believe this. I met Hal Blaine and I started telling him what he told me. And he goes, you got a book there. And I go, I'm not a writer. There's no way. And he said, you'd be surprised. You have access to these guys. You're meeting them. And he said the line, you know, you, you're not getting any, I was in my what thirties. You're not getting any younger. They're not getting, <laughs> you should as a fan, pick out the drummers and do it. I said, uh, never gonna happen. Long story short, it did happen, and yeah, uh, I'm so glad now. You know, it, 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 this this again goes in the category of a tremendously uh, profitable spiritual journey for me. Terribly financially unrewarded. Ended up, you know, spending my own money on the pictures because I wanted to make it great. Yeah, and I think it is great, and you know, it I. It, all the interviews were done mostly by me, some with me and Bob. The Ringo interview, Bob Santelli and I went to Ringo's house, Tittenhurst Park. And, you know, I had met Ringo uh, earlier when we played. Jim Keltner brought Ringo and Bob Dylan to a show we did in 1980 in Los Angeles. And um, there's a very funny picture of the three of us in the E Street Band dressing room because Dylan <laughs> insisted that since he was my guest, I got them tickets, he had to hang out with me and the <laughs> of the band, not Ruth. <laughs> There's, and it, I don't know how, someone took this picture and I've had it for years, it got out on, on, on uh, I guess, inter Instagram or Pinterest, and I've seen it online. It's Ringo, me, I mean, I look like a 12 year old and Bob Dylan's got his head on my shoulder like this, which is really, I'm a little taller than he is. It was really funny, but 
Um, that was the night I met Ringo. And of course I was completely, you know, gobsmacked and, and tongue tied. And, uh, uh, you know, it took me, that really took me years to be able to call him Richie or rich, you know, I mean, yeah. Ringo, you know, and, uh, but, uh, he was very gracious and, uh, uh with the interview and he hadn't done i don't think any interviews since at that point uh since the beatles had broken up um so you know and it was strictly focused on why he became a drummer the one of the interesting things i found out was from him and dave clark who contrary to the myth again uh people think he didn't play on those records he absolutely played on those records some of those records have two drummers on them uh there are some drummers, there's some records of the Dave Clark Five where the Hal Blaine of England, Clem Catini played drums because Dave was producing. Mm -hmm. But I saw Dave Clark twice in 64 and 65 in New Jersey. And I'm here to tell you that guy was a monster on the drums. Real simple, but really steady and powerful. And the records reflect that. But an observation that both Ringo Dave Clark and Charlie Watts made was that in 1957, England ended the draft, the military service. Mm. Suddenly had all these teenagers who didn't have to go into the military. And that gave them, that freed them up. Yeah, wow. English guys, you know, uh, Bill Wyman was in the, 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 the English Air Force. Right. Yes. Um, uh, but that was a big sigh of relief to these guys who had endured, you know, uh, I mean, you start to talk to whether it was Charlie or Ringo or any of those drummers, you know, the bombings that they endured um, is, is something you'd never forget, you know. So, um, interestingly, Ringo and Charlie had never met Dave Clark until... I don't know if Charlie ever met him. We played at Earl's Court, which is in a venue in London. Mm -hmm. And uh, I invited um, Dave and I invited Ringo. And they both came on the same night. And Clem Catini also came. Wow. Still alive and well. And is in, yeah. in his, uh, his greatest performance, in my uh, opinion, was uh, Hurdy Gurdy Man by Donovan. But he mm -hmm. played on he was the Hal Blaine of England. Yep. Uh, he had a guy named Bobby Graham, but delightful guy. But so Ringo and Dave Clark met that night. Oh, that's, you know, and it could have been the Northern Southern thing, but Ringo lived in London and Dave lived in London for years. At least that's what they told me. So, you know, I've been blessed in that, that uh, I've been able to meet and get to know these guys. Johnny B, the drummer, uh, for Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels, who also played on the song Free Ride by Edgar Winter. And I was at that session at Columbia Studios. I put him on the cover of the book because that's how good he was. To me, yeah. he was the most badass rock drummer I ever saw. I saw Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels at a nightclub in New York. I had fake ID that my father got me. In those days, you could get away with that. It wasn't a government, you know, it was like just a, like a birth certificate. And, you know, me and my friend got into this club with Mitch Ryder and Detroit Wheels, I'd say six or eight months after Jenny Take a Ride came out. And it was unbelievable. And I'll never forget, John, you know, I always thought that Johnny B, for his drumming, uh, maybe not what he wanted to do, but, you know, he would have been the perfect replacement rather than me. Uh, in the East Street Band. I'm glad it didn't happen, but <laughs> Johnny B is just one of the most incredible rock drummers I ever saw. You know, yeah. he played on all the hits. Yeah, know, absolutely. Devil with a Blue Dress. Yeah. Talking about, um, and let's, talking about those songs for one second, I mean, I, I, I had made a note about the Detroit medley, which is always a high point of, of seeing a, an East Street Band show, and you guys... I know you don't play maybe every show, but quite often. And, and, um, and I've, I've heard those versions, the original versions from, from Mitch Ryder. Did he play 16th notes on the bass drum the way you did? 
when you uh on jenny take a ride on jenny take a ride oh this is, that's a great question he played uh eighth notes on the bass drum but he he left out the backbeat so it's and the and the tempo there's no metronome on it but i've made a study of jenny take a ride and it's about 200 beats a minute and he's going boom boom bop boom boom bop boom boom bop boom boom bop boom 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 bop and through the whole song i mean yeah and i that's an interesting observation because when I play old rock and roll or even our, you know, some R stuff, I was a drummer who came up playing uh, eighth notes on the bass drum. Boom, 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 right? And, uh, and that's the way, you know, I played those songs. I, I didn't, that's, because that's the way, you know, when you're playing in a little 45, that's what I was hearing. Yeah. I was hearing yeah. Stay steady eighth notes. But it's actually harder to play. Boom, boom, pop, boom, boom, pop, boom, boom, pop. Incredibly fast. I can do it now, but um, uh, so that eighth note thing in the E Street Band became kind of one of my drum signatures, and um, uh, there was an interesting experience I had when I uh, Zach Alfred, fabulous drummer who played with the B Fifty Twos, played with David Bowie, amazing drummer one of the deepest pocket drummers I've ever heard. And I'm sure he's still playing, but, but Bruce put the band, uh, a band together after the E Street band uh, broke up and, uh, and he went on tour in 92 and 93. It's a really good band in my view. Um, but he took, he changed all the eighth notes to quarter notes. And he was so much younger than me that, so, which gave it more of a disco E feel. He came up as a disco drummer and um gave it kind of a different totally different feel yeah yeah i would think so yeah it was a little bit more about wild abandon you know um i mean if i'm asked to play like keith moon i can do that yeah yeah I love keith moon. and i saw keith moon in the who's debut in new york city in 1967 so i have a visceral memory of they only played three songs and then they trashed their equipment and I was in the fourth row at a Murray the Chris Easter special. And I was 16 years old and I'd never, I'd never experienced anything like that. And those are the days where you could experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, having seen you guys, the first, you, you mentioned 1978 playing the Roxy. I, that was the first tour that I saw you on darkness on the edge of town. And uh, I had a whole bunch of, things I was going to get into, but I know we're, we're getting tight on time, but I was going to say that was my first time seeing you. And I, and I, it's, it's embedded in my memory, Max, because what I, what I came away from seeing that show was this, I'd never seen a band with so much energy be so tight. Uh, you know what I mean? And you, you mentioned the, and the, who was a tight band too, obviously, but, but there was a certain sort of sloppiness. And I say that with the, with the greatest respect. I love Keith Moon myself and I, and I love the who, but you know, you sort of their sound was conducive to a, a more loose. But you guys, you had this two guitar, two keyboard, horn player, bass drums band that was like as tight as as tight as any. Like if you saw a, a show band playing nightclubs six nights a week, five five sets a night, like you were that tight. That's what it reminded me of. Was like this. Or you just described the E Street band. That's yeah. Exactly exactly what we were we used to do two shows a night two three hour shows a night so we all came out of the era where you had to play five and six 15 minute sets in the clubs yeah. where there were so many clubs you could play seven nights a week if you had a circuit and so that was unbelievable training you know and i listen i was listening to satellite radio the other day and i heard a uh, a show from 78 i guess and I, I was struck by, I mean, we played everything like a bat out of hell very fast, but we had an unbelievable groove in the, but we were playing at yeah. such breakneck tempos and it was unbelievably tight. Just stop yeah. on it. But, but we were playing, you know, and when I joined the first tour I did, you know, we were playing the first and well, really for the first three or four years, five, six nights a week, two shows a night you know, traveling in cars than a van, you know, like, like bands do. I don't know about so much more now because live music is getting harder and harder to present and to get gigs like that. But 
we were just, we, you know, we were in our 20s and we were like, you know, lightning in a bottle. And it is amazing how tight we were. And the other thing was we were, because we were playing small places, we were always set up like right on top of each other. And as we got more successful and, and the gigs got bigger, like now, you know, I'm probably 45 feet away from Gary Talent. You know, you yeah. play in a baseball stadium, you're like, I'm still, I'm, I'm, I think I'm 10 feet behind Bruce, but I'm directly behind him. Yeah. So my, the geometry, and it, and it has a lot to do with geometry, because if you're on the, the, the diagonal on a 45 degree angle from where the cues are coming from and where the, everything is sort of coming from, there's a slight delay just in your perception of, because, you know, you're not vertical to that peak. Yeah. I'm vertical. They're, geometrically speaking, they're at the bottom of the triangle. So I've noticed it's an interesting phenomenon. We're still extremely, extremely tight, but we don't play, we definitely don't play things as fast as we used to. Now we're playing, and we don't play things as slow as we did in the 2000s. <laughs> we first got back together, and which was something I was a, sort of a uh, uh, persistent in addressing the tempos that we're playing. Some of the some of the classic songs, you know, I I felt they had just gotten into uh, a bit of loping territory instead of really pushing. Mm -hmm. and, but but it's it's also a function of you know you're so far away from each other on a stadium stage that it's not like being in a club where you're all crammed together. Um, although the feeling is the same, it's so relaxed on stage, you know, that, yeah. that it, that's exactly the same. And, uh, but it, it's, it, when I hear those, you know, Jay made a fun, my son made a funny comment once when he heard an old show from 76 or 70 he goes, you sound like a punk band. <laughs> yeah. Um, held up without a gun, which is, I think it's on the River album. Uh, uh, yeah, we played so fast and it was just -na 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 like a punk band. So I said, yeah, I guess we were kind of a punk band, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I, it, our friend Charlie, I remember him saying this, too. I mean, it was kind of the norm, I think, for bands in, at that in the 70s to play songs faster. I think there was just a almost like accepted practice, right, to just take a song that was... 120 BPMs on the record to 125 or 130, you know, or. Well, the other thing I remember is that nobody, except film scores, nobody used a tempo reference. Yeah. Nobody used a click track. Nobody used a metronome or simpty, which was used for film scoring. It wasn't done. That, that came in, um, in the disco era when yeah. they wanted a metronomic, uh, beat. It did create a, a generation of drummers who keep much better strict time than a lot of the drummers in the 60s. But if you listen to a song like Little Bit of Soul mm -hmm. from 1967, obviously that drum, clearly that drummer's not playing to a click track. And and he, he speeds up, he does this one fill where he speeds up and it's it's the perfect moment, perfect rock and roll moment. <laughs> Both. um and uh but nobody then except maybe the motown acts who who consistently played their stage shows faster nobody was saying let's play this faster it was just the excitement and the adrenaline of playing as sort of young kids and as you get older and hopefully wiser you learn how to control it rather than the excitement of you know uh i mean when i joined we were playing clubs and small 900 seat theaters you know and to me you know having a club sold out when i first joined the e street band was top of the world you know yeah and somebody set up my drums that was like i had heard that that happened you know uh but i <laughs> experienced it until i until i joined the e street band so at every step you know uh the biggest jump in my view was from arenas uh from uh municipal auditoriums like about three to five thousand seats to arenas that was a big uh psychological jump because it looks yeah. so big 
arenas to stadiums, like a basketball arena to a football stadium, doesn't look that different to me. Um, it's basically just a bigger version of an arena. But getting out of the, and there was, they're not so much around anymore, but the municipal auditoriums, which were all built pretty much in the 30s and 40s, mainly the 30s, um, they were great venues. Uh, that was the, that was the, uh, you know, the wheelhouse of the Beatles. You see yeah, all the yeah. in the Cleveland Municipal Auditorium, you know, uh, which is where they have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame occasionally, the award show. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I thought, wow, it doesn't get any, somebody setting up my drums does not get any better. <laughs> I, but I do my gigs with, the, with any of the bands I play with other than Bruce. I get there early. I set up my drums. I tune my drums to this day. If I play with my little four piece cover band, it's called the jukebox because we play audience requests. And I, I did, I've done 300 gigs with them. Uh, I get there early, I tune the drums, I set them up because I want it right. Yeah. You know? yeah. And the budgets are so that I don't have a crew. There's no right. crew. So it's like being 14 years old again in a band and <laughs> got a gig. <laughs> well, next time you play in Boston, I'll be there to, I'll be your tech for the day. And I, I mean that too. I'll take you up on that for sure. All right. I'd be honored to. I, I just, I have to tell you too, that time I saw you in 78, you played at the Augusta Civic Center in Augusta, Maine. And that reminds me of what you're describing, like a, a, a civic auditorium. It was a, you know, no, no AC, obviously just a big auditorium. And it was about a thousand degrees by the time you guys got into the third song. Oh, I remember the Augusta uh, Civic Center, and yeah. we played in Maine. I believe we've played in Portland since then. But um, what really stands out is we went. It was the first time we flew in a a private plane. Wow! It was a little Cessna, single engine Cessna, and when we all were crowded into this thing, and we were all terrified none of us had ever been in such a small plane and we never flew anywhere, but we had yeah. a gig in, in somewhere in the South the next day we had to fly and we're sitting in the plane and we had to get out because the plane sprung a leak. But they got us another little plane. It was like a, you know, a six or eight passenger plane. And there were only six of us on the road and it was, and we finally got a plane and we flew and you never saw white knuckle flyers in your life. <laughs> and I remember it was Bruce, Steve Van Zandt, Clarence Clemens, Danny Federici, Gary Talent, myself, Roy Bitten. And we were like, you know, <laughs> time. we've gotten used to, you know, getting around these days. But, you know, it's a lifetime of memories. I'm glad to share a few of them. With you, John, you know, uh, and uh, on behalf of the Weinberg drummers, I want to thank you for the uh, both the incredible friendship and, uh, you know, uh, with with or without you, I'd be playing Zildjian cymbals. But the fact that you made life so easy for us and all the drummers, you talk to Ringo, you talk to, uh, you know, Charlie Watts in the old days, Buddy. You uh, were uh, uh, an important part of our drumming careers. So I'm delighted to be on your podcast and talk about that. It's a Thank new you, career Max. for you, you know, and um, Thank uh, you. hey, what can I say? You know, it was a, tr it was a treat when uh, Mr. Zildjian took me into your vault. Uh, I remember. And, uh, and gave me a symbol from the 1930s that you know he had his private vault that i guess he kept the symbols that he liked and i was on tv i was performing on tv and he gave it to me and that was the symbol that i used from the day i got it i never only ever used it i never used it again i've only ever used it when i was on the late night tv programs and in the bell underneath and it was really it was also because it the, the zildjian symbol uh, got so much there were uh, you know camera shots of the symbols a lot so there was no logo except for the old stamp right and which you could obviously see, see it was a zildjian and um uh but underneath it uh, i put in black uh, you know magic marker uh armand 
Oh, man, that's beautiful. Armand symbol. Now, they have a line of Armand symbols. This was the one that he gave me from the vault. And it was, a, a, you know, made, made out of uh, hurricane fencing. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and by the way, the last picture, the last picture that I took with Charlie Watts, I'm on one side and you're on the other. I know. Isn't that something? That's that's one of my dearest photos. Oh, there uh, you go. There it is. And, I, and I'll just, before I let you go, I'm going to just tell everybody this story. This was, um, the Stones played in Newark, New Jersey at the Prudential Center on December 13th, 2012. And it was the night after you guys had all done a big uh, benefit for the hurricane victims, right? Hurricane Sandy, I yeah. think it was 12, 12, 12. Yes, that's and, right. Yep, and I saw you and Becky, um, before we took this picture, I bumped into you backstage and you gave me a big hug. I had just announced I was leaving Zildjian and, and, and you were so gracious and we had a nice conversation. And then later I, I found my way to Charlie's dressing room and there you guys were chatting. And I remember this, Charlie said, where have you been? We were just talking about you or something. And, uh, and your wonderful wife had the great idea to take this picture. She said, let me get a picture of you guys. So... Yes, yeah, great shot. And, uh, you know, my hair was a lot less gray. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, and Charlie, uh, I had the occasion that night to, to remind Charlie the first time I saw him play was at the, what was called the Mosque Theater at the time. It's now called Symphony Hall uh, with the Stones, Patti LaBelle on the Bluebells. And he remembered... When I mentioned Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells, he remembered that show in New Jersey because he was a big fan. And then I said, uh, you know, uh, uh, have you, you know, do you know much about Jersey? He goes, Jersey? I've been to Jersey a million times. My sister married a guy, Charlie says this, who lives in Tom's River. Wow. You're kidding. He goes, exit 98. <laughs> and, uh, which <laughs> Jersey thing. Oh, yeah. Exit, right. And I never knew that, you know, that he had some sort of familial family roots. And as I say, in, in Jersey, he was just a, such a lovely, uh, soft-spoken guy and um, uh, miss him dearly all the time. But apart from his, you know, his incredible, incredible drumming, um, uh, his sole granddaughter uh, came to see us play in uh, London recently. And... Um, you know, that was, that was a thrill because that was such a big, and I still am, I'm such a huge Charlie Watts, you know, fan. And uh, to consider him a friend, uh, you know, when I, wrote, when I wrote the big beat and I interviewed him, um, <laughs> after I, I sent him a copy to his office in London and he called me, he goes, you actually did it. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, I'm surprised too. <laughs> you know, I, I actually uh, finished. He goes, can you send me a box? So he wanted to give it to all his friends who he thought would enjoy it. And because I put the spotlight on the drummer, right? Yeah, yeah. Reading about some of the older drummers, like, you know, DJ Fontana mentioning Don Lamont, who was a big influence on DJ Fontana. Don Lamont famously played on a lot of stuff, but famously played the drums on uh, Beyond the Sea, Bobby Darren. So oh, where yeah. he, those drum breaks, he was a big New York session drummer in the 40s and 50s. Um, and he may have played with Maynard Ferguson for a while. I know he played with some of the big, you know, lead instrumentalists at the time. But, you know, to hear, to, to read a book, a contemporary book, and have Don Lamont mentioned, that was something. And, uh, so I remember he gave a book to Keith Richard and Keith wrote me the loveliest thank you note. Oh man. Just cause he's such a fan of drum drummers and musicians, you mm -hmm. know, he's a musician, Keith Richard. And, you know, so to get that, that was just, you know, icing on me. Uh, and like yourself, we used to go see Charlie with his various side projects, his quintet, his orchestra. And, uh, uh, you know, just uh, always a gentleman, a sweetheart. Yeah. 
have the greatest way of ushering you along out of their private dressing room area because meeting the Stones, as you know, any one of them was kind of like a, uh, you know, a receiving line at Buckingham <laughs> Palace or the White House. And uh, you're ushered in and, a, and this, of course he knew me, but you know, I was with my children who were young at the time and you chat for five minutes. And then Charlie had this great sign off where he, he'd grab your hand, he'd shake your hand and he'd say, and so where are you off to now? <laughs> and it was the classiest brush off you could. <laughs> and I've used that and I tell people all the time, <laughs> it's time to end the conversation. Uh, so where are you off to now? <laughs> Charlie Watts. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. That's, oh, oh. To now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go get reacquainted with my wife, uh, who sends her regards to you, by the way, but Max, this has been so fun. And I just, I will just end this by saying, um, I, I couldn't have, it couldn't have been more thrilling for me to join you. And I don't know if you remember this, when you played here in town last year, you had me come up. I actually invited myself up when you did honky tonk woman and played the cowbell and uh and played too not easy well, to... I, yeah I, I remember you said to me um you said do you know how do you know how it goes or something and you said not that i don't trust you john but just and i and i played the little intro the little dink 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 you went good good okay <laughs> uh, and it's very specific it's a very specific part yeah. and and it, and it doesn't change through the right. whole story. right you know, it's a little bit I'll do because you want to hear that, right? And, you know, I knew you would obviously be able to nail it. You wouldn't believe what they play it. You know, as soon as the drums come in, they lose it if they're not. Yeah, in. yeah. But no, uh, I, I... <laughs> it made the song. You know, there's another song where the cowbell part is integral to the song. Give me some lovin' by Spencer Davis group. I had, I'll tell you this one last story. I had the occasion to be in what they called an all-star band. And I think it was 2005 with, it was a fundraiser for the City of Hope out in uh, Los Angeles. Paul Schaefer was the music director. Narda Walden played drums. I played drums. And they had a, a third set set up for John Sykes, who was being honored at the time he was the head of VH1. Uh, Michelle and Degicello played bass. Uh, Eddie Van Halen played guitar. Richie Sambora. Stevie Winwood played organ and sang. What a band. Wow. So the backup singers were Don Henley, Cheryl Crow, and two other people who I'm, I don't remember. John Mellencamp played, uh, Brian Adams. Um, uh, so anyway, we're, we're rehearsing Give Me Some Lovin'. And Don was singing backup. He had nothing to do. So I said, well, Don, this is great cowbell part why don't you play that so i showed it to him dun, 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 dun. it's a real offbeat thing and it's yeah. very varied in the mix but if you're a you know 45 single geek like i am you know all the parts so when we were rehearsing at this rehearsal studio and and i showed him the part and then we played with stevie winwood he got this big smile on his face that we played the cowbell part right that's dedication, and, yeah. Yeah, because it's it it offsets that do 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 boom, and nobody plays that. We played it right. Nobody yeah. plays it correctly. We played it correctly. That's and great. I pride myself on doing that. So, with that, Max, I thank you so much, and I and I I will warn you. I'm going to invite you back again in the near future. Um, I would love to do a, a what I call track talk. Uh, and, and maybe just get into a couple of songs, maybe just some, uh, but more, more on that later. But I just want to thank you for being here today so much. Well, thank you, John. Thank you for your friendship. This opportunity, uh, we'll have to do a volume two of this conversation because basically we've been, we've been having these conversations backstage at all these other concerts for years and years. So it was nice to be able to do it, uh, on your podcast and bring it out to the, uh, uh, the wide world out there. So I hope people enjoyed it. And uh, uh, I know that I'm going back on the road in um, March with Bruce and the E Street Band, do a bunch of makeup dates, and you'll see a lot of us out there. And I'm playing 
sporadic dates with my jukebox. So people should check. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll put the link uh, in in this episode to your website for the jukebox band and um, yeah, and assorted other things. So thank you so much, Max. Thank you. John, I'll be talking to you so long. But thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you soon. Big hand for Max Weinberg. And thanks again for watching.